Welcome, welcome to Black Ink Cinema Podcast, the directing duo, Joe Brewster and Michelle Stevenson. Uh, you have been shortlisted at this year's Oscars for the uplifting Black Voices through documentary. I want to know everything, especially about the documentaries that have been shortlisted and a brief summary of, of each documentary. Well, uh, Going to Mars, the Nikki Giovanni Project, um, is a film that profiles um, the life and work of the uh, Black arts movement poet, uh, Nikki Giovanni, who is uh, still with us today and has been very prolific over the last few decades, but is a very special type of documentary because um, we take a very non-traditional approach. Um, it is what we like to call a time travel through space and earth um, through the mind of this uh, seminal poet, Nikki Giovanni. Well, Black Girls Play, uh, there are some similarities, but it's a short documentary which examines the, the important contribution of uh, games. Uh, in this case, um, the games that are played by Black girls worldwide uh, and um, how they contributed to... Uh, almost every form of popular American culture, from jazz to gospel to rock to R&B. And that's a very exciting uh, discovery. Or, uh, and I say the words discovery intentionally because their important contribution has been erased. Yes. And that is part of what we do at, um, at uh, Rada Studio is... Uh, is prevent the erasure of uh, these contributions, which, uh, for our, from our point of view, allows for greater agency uh, uh, of women and Black women specifically. And we try to do that. It's not just excavating the erased or the unseen, but use it in a way that challenges the form. Um, so I think both Definitely. films in their in their approach, um, um, have a very special um, uh, storytelling sort of uh, structure and device, mm -hmm. the way we use visuals, music, editing, and sound. So, so the, uh, our process is to uh, unearth information historically, to uplift mm -hmm. character, to not shy away from difficult subject matter, but also to entertain. And the, and the interesting thing about both films, uh, people leave with a smile on their face and thinking, wow. Uh, and that, that's an accomplishment. I'm absolutely guilty of that because after watching both of them, first of all, the knowledge and information I took from Black girls play I was like I didn't know I didn't know that I didn't know this and I'm like this needs to be taught in schools this is like information that we all need to know I don't understand how I've lived as long as I have <laughs> without knowing how imperative um, a childhood game that I used to play has affected the world essentially and since we're talking about black girls play the story of hand games where can people watch it just before we get into dissecting the movie well, currently it's available on ESPN Plus, um, which is a subscription um, platform. But I do think that the people at um, uh, ESPN 30 for 30 and ESPN Films, this is under their umbrella, are really uh, looking to see uh, and work very rigorously on community engagement and outreach approaches where we can make this accessible um, mm -hmm. to a, a much wider audience. You know, the film is about Black girls play in a sport on a sports channel where, you know, the vast majority of the audience are, you know, uh, male uh, loving uh, sports loving men. <laughs> and so um, and so but again, I think the approach with the uh, leadership at ESPN Films, they understand the potential of the film. So I think that another way to stay up to date to uh, on uh, where the film is will be screening or what what is happening with the film is to go to our website as well, Rada Studio 
org and we'll, we have news a newsletter that comes out that keeps people informed on where our work is being shown. Uh, I, I say kudos to ESPN for attempting to expand their audience, but also expand the notion of what is sport mm -hmm. and who who uh, gets to participate. Mm -hmm. uh, and going into a more granular uh, meaning of uh, the importance of sport. You, you know, uh, uh, one of the first things we learned was that games are the, uh, so important in terms of the uh, development of children. They teach mm -hmm. people how to socialize. Uh, and there are studies that show that, that the creativity of a nation is determined by the games that, that uh, we play. And um, and that's a essential uh, uh, element of our ability to grow and prosper. Mm -hmm. I loved um, what I loved see seeing is the innocence of little black girls in this documentary. Um, as we don't get to see it often in the mainstream, I feel anyway, just like having fun, enjoying themselves, and being little girls. I feel like we're often aged as as black girls. So was that something that you wanted to highlight? Well, it's something we always highlight. But the, the point is that they are innocent and they are having fun, uh, despite any other uh, uh, the the myriad of obstacles that they have to face because of uh, mm -hmm. race and gender. So mm -hmm. we don't see it in the movies. Uh, why not? And so what we like to say is it's easy for us to show it. It's easy for us to inspire people because they don't show it. It's it's like it's um, what we live. We live through it. In some ways, <laughs> it well, sh there's de of course an intentionality, but it's also um, it's what we've experienced. You know, as people mm. of the Black diaspora. You know, I'm originally from the Caribbean, from Haiti, and so it was just mm. about the, the very natural sort of um, um, obvious for us, right? Uh, yeah. um, uh, uh, representation and connection that we wanted to show. I think it's yeah. it's really the, the the stereotype or the aging, as you've mentioned, that yeah. um, because it comes from a lens at times that doesn't know us, right? That doesn't know our communities that yeah. falls into the traps. So yes, it was an intentionality, but intentionality was really about representing what we what we what we have grown up with or we have lived with on a day-to-day -day basis with our cousins, our aunts, our uncles, you know. Well, without this getting too intellectual, but let me just say this. Uh, uh, the reason uh, it's surprising uh, is because the stereotypes which exist, and, um, and that's why I talk about uh, archiving and unearthing history. So when you are going against stereotype, uh, it's a shocker for people, but it shouldn't be. And um, and so one of these days, the stereotypes will be gone. Probably not in my lifetime. <laughs> Being all the fingers crossed. <laughs> I hope so. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. What inspired you to tell this story? Because I know unearthing archives and and finding our truth and sharing our truth. But what inspired you? Was there a particular moment, experience? It was really through our conversations with ESPN. We had spent a, actually a couple of years trying to find the right story that, that we wanted right. to tell with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they actually approached us with this article and the book that Kira Gaunt, who is a, a main participant in the film, wrote. She's an ethnomusicologist, a black woman right. from Maryland who uh, all of her work is dedicated to uh, unearthing these connections as an ethnomusicologist. And we were just completely blown away by the book, by the story. And it was a, it was a big discovery for us. And so it really, we were very excited to then, you know, sink our teeth into it. Definitely. I love the correlation made between history and the use of music and communication. Like that's something mm -hmm. that I think I don't know, I just take for granted and it's just something that I'm used to seeing every day and it's something that we, I grew up in, whether it be at home or at school. So it was really nice to feel even part of a bigger community mm -hmm. as well. 
Well, well, the important part is that communication doesn't have to be verbal, mm. and that embodied uh, communication uh, is quite powerful mm. and uh, and effective at uh, transmitting uh, emotion, transmitting mm. hope, uh, trans. Uh, meeting what's safe and what's unsafe. And so that um, it's not always written in a book. Right. And yes. in this case, it's even more significant. It's transmitting culture, you know, yeah. culture beyond, be, in spite of, you know, in spite mm. of um, the violence and oppression and the attempt to take mm. away, to remove culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it be it became this safe vessel that you mm -hmm. cannot really uh, take away yeah. uh, uh, from generation to generation. Absolutely, and I feel like it's um, it's our superpower to kind of, in spite of everything, we we still rise above it. We're still able to have joy. We're still able to love one another and and do all these things and create. <laughs> you know, constantly creating. Mm -hmm. Um, so when, when we're in uh, screenings, what we found is that the audience uh, uh, began to recite uh, the rhymes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and for the audience, uh, who, the audience that doesn't know the film, uh, these are rhymes that are pretty ubiquitous. They, they may have started uh, in one community, but they're, they're uh, worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, and to see how um, a nurse, a rhyme like M Miss Mary Mack, right, uh, impacts people uh, mm -hmm. and is, as, as, has moved around the world is, is pretty amazing. So whoever's in the audience, they're, they're moving and they're smiling and they're, and they're, and they're repeating uh, the words, you, you know, uh, but, you know, what we, some of the ways in which this film inspires folks is the, uh, you can see in uh, Going to Mars, the Nikki Giovanni yeah. project, yeah. which is, which is really about uh, words and sound and rhythm as well, but using mm -hmm. uh, poetry, which is kind of similar, yeah. don't you think? Uh, Absolutely to the mm -hmm. rhymes Definitely. of children. And both of those had a, a lovely theme through it um, of just creating art and art that has influenced the world as well. Um, I was completely unaware of a lot of the popular music that had copied uh, a, lot of the, a lot of these um, hand game songs. And, you know, the, the classic Nas Uchiwali, which, you know, during high school, secondary school, that was my jam, you know? Um, I didn't know that was based on a Jamaican game song. So it's things like that, that I'm not, when I was um, speaking to you, Michelle, earlier, like, this needs to be in schools. This, I don't know if the next step is to approach schools to tell more of a wider music history because it's affecting popular culture, you know? Yeah, it's affecting popular culture, but also it's that um, Black women's and Black young girls' contribution to it is being erased. Mm -hmm. In this yeah. case, you know, hip hop being, you know, uh, predominantly male space that where it is historically been difficult um, for women to really be represented in their full selves. Um, this this uh, short film is even more important when we look at it that way. Um, in sort of um, resetting the, the, the influence and power. Yeah. Um, you've got some great contributors in this. What was the process in selecting them? Well, normally we uh, have researchers who um, spend a, a fair <laughs> amount of time uh, finding uh, subjects we spend, we interview them uh, via mm -hmm. Zoom, uh, not unlike this experience. Mm -hmm. And we choose people who we think would be <laughs> great on camera. That means uh, smiling, uh, emoting, and, and uh, providing mm -hmm. the information in a way that 
it's um, accessible. Uh, so we we also wanted to to travel. So what what we did is we found in in multiple areas around the country. We traveled to uh, Tennessee, mm. uh, uh, New York. Part of this was shot in our home, but but what we did is we found a, an amazing um, editor located in Mexico City, uh, who is Venezuelan, and also had an experience with these uh, these these rhymes in in Venezuela. And she discovered connections that even were more international. There are, uh, there's footage from the Dominican Republic, uh, from Liberia, from uh, East Africa, uh, and I believe Brazil. Uh, and so that we could, you know, demonstrate the power and the, and the, and the reach of, of this work. I yeah. think also in terms of uh, we wanted to be very intentional about it being sort of intergenerational in terms of the contributions mm. of the people we interviewed, it yeah. being centered around women's voices. We knew that Kira Gaunt, the ethnomusicologist who wrote the book, would be at the core, right, of the of the of the structure of the of the piece. But you know, Marvely Moore, who you know teaches music. Uh, um, and uh, conducts workshops. Uh, we, when she's from, she lives in Knoxville and Tennessee, and she was able to connect us with these young women, uh, middle schooler and high schoolers, who played in this schoolhouse that we found um, that is a historical sort of a wooden uh, uh, one room schoolhouse that we used. And um, seeing that intergenerational play between her experiences and them actually playing through uh, the programs that they're involved in. And then later we have the intergenerational uh, uh, discussions with um, uh, Elena Pinderhughes, who is a, a very, um, who is basically a genius flutist, jazz musician, who can trace Seven. back to her training. Yeah. And, yeah. and Jamila Woods, was able to sort of center what the what what it meant to belong for her how hand games mm -hmm. actually were devised for her to belong to her community um yeah. where in some cases she was isolated and mm -hmm. uh and how she turned you know the work into a a political statement also mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. with one of the uh, the rhymes so yeah. those were also very sort of intentional so we had these these contributions from women of different ages who, yeah. who are experts in their field. Absolutely. I think one of the things that we try to avoid is experts, is specifically male experts. We mm. search for them. <laughs> and uh, luckily, uh, they weren't available <laughs> or they didn't shine like the women who were mm. uh, involved in, uh, in the games. Mm. And kudos to my wife for recognizing that and, and, and putting me back on track. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. <laughs> but how do you think we can restore the power balance? Because as we've seen, women are very instrumental and influential in hip hop, in music, but it's pretty much a man's game. Well, I do think, I don't know how, I don't have the full solution, but I do know that what we're doing in terms of in terms of, of uh, shining a light through narrative and through story has a very powerful impact. For me, storytelling is healing. Um, it has, uh, it's validating. Mm. And I think uh, the more people we can reach with a story like Black Girls Play, the more, you know, young girls we can, you know, uh, we can affect who can hopefully maybe, you know, mm. um, feel um, not just validated, but um, uh, work through life, you know, or, or, or walk through life with a sense of self that can, you know, impact um, the rest of the people that they are in touch with, as well as themselves. So it's first well, to think about healing through the stories. Yeah. You know. Well, yeah. one thing is clear. Uh, millions of people will see this film because of ESPN. Mm -hmm. I've been in the audience 
And I've seen little girls spark and say, uh, and smile and say, wow, I did that. My mom did mm -hmm. that. My grandma did that. So when you have that kind of information, you have that understanding, um, you can say, step aside. I have something uh, of value. Uh, so all we're, we're, all we're providing is the history and we're mm -hmm. feeding to, it to you uh, this pill of history uh, in a custard. It's called our filmmaking in a, process. In a yummy custard. <laughs> Do you guys have um, any favorite hand games yourself? I, I don't know, really. I mean, I think I played the most. It was probably Miss Mary Mac. I'm the most sort of uh, uh, used to. It's the easiest one. <laughs> so, yeah. I uh, I just wanted to point out that that uh, that I grew up next door, meaning the guys would be playing while the girls uh, would be playing next uh, playing uh, basketball or football, where the girls were uh, mm. you know a few feet away doing hand games. It was something that I didn't have the expertise in, but and I. I was intimidated by the amount of uh, athleticism associated with these mm -hmm. games. And uh, so I just appreciate it now. And I wish I had taken more advantage of it. I'd probably be, you know, a better filmmaker. <laughs> no, you're great. You're great. Um, we were talking about the mainstream, and I know black TikTokers are constantly being robbed of their trends, but I hadn't made the connection with with it being the new hand game, um, which I just thought like completely blew my mind. Um, and now I can't unsee it. So, <laughs> and I'm terrible as well. So I leave that to my, my nieces. Um, who, who made that correlation? Because I just think it was fantastic. It was part of our research process, really, in conversations yeah. with, you know, many people, um, including Kira Gaunt. But I think um, in some ways, um, Elena sort of brought it home, but we were looking at where are black girls innovating today, right? Mm -hmm. The technology is, is, is in some ways is a vessel, right? Is a vessel mm -hmm. in this case for creativity. And we know that wherever we're innovating, because we're constantly innovating, uh, there is also appropriation. And how does that appropriation take place? And mm -hmm. we know that there have been battles in the TikTok space around Yes. innovations that black girls have done and um and then others have taken credit for or have gotten remuner remuneration for so we mm -hmm. wanted to include that as this continuum you know as this next level i i i don't think that appropriation of of uh is ever going to end and uh and so and so i i, I have another way of looking at it like if you look at the 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 the, the important pillars of of, uh, of these games or the important pillars of what they call Afro Atlantic, wherever we landed and where we came from, uh, mm -hmm. culture. So there is a call for innovation and creativity in the middle of the circle. You've seen it in jazz and hip hop and mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, but the the thing is. We are, we are welcoming other cultures to enter yeah. the circle. And then we have to go back in the circle and innovate again. It is an opportunity for more innovation, for better music, for better oratory, for better athletics, uh, for growth. But at the end of the day, we want to give credit where credit is due. Mm -hmm. But... And economics, that's another conversation. That's a deeper conversation. Who, who oh, yeah. benefits economically? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What we find is, and you can see it sort of in, in certain cases in hip hop, right? So, you know, the hand games influence the hip hop. The hip hop appropriates, but then capitalism happens, <laughs> involves, and then there's a commodification of the, of the form and then a stagnation in some cases of the innovation. And then new innovation happens on the underground that then 
you know, gets influenced again. And you see it over and over and over again. We will constantly innovate. I mean, that's part of, you know, uh, um, what our humanity uh, uh, tells us to do in these circumstances. And so um, it's important to be able to honor that innovation and center it. Yeah, absolutely. And to keep having the strength to keep going in and reinventing oneself and coming back with something new, setting new trends, you know. What is one thing you would want people to take away after watching Black Dolls play the story of Hand Games? I, I think when I watch the film, uh, it's not what other people think. I, I think of my mom and, and, uh, and how uh, important uh, she was in my life. Like when I was in church and she was beating that tambourine and it was uh, polyrhythmic and I was trying so hard to understand that those rhythms, those are the rhythms of my life. And uh, you'll see it in our editing, you'll see it in, uh, uh, in, in so many ways, in the way we speak. Uh, and and I'm, I'm grateful f that I, I saw that, yeah. but I didn't appreciate it at the time. That's wonderful. Um, honestly, I'm, I'm very sure when everyone gets a chance to see it, they're gonna feel exactly how I did, because it is a beautiful piece of art. Um, and then moving on to your other documentary, um, Going to Mars, the Nikki Giovanni Project, who is an incredible, influential poet. I mean, Going to Mars, uh, we like to call it this time travel through space and Earth, uh, used through, you know, a snippet of the mind of uh, the genius mind of Nikki Giovanni and through her poetry. So uh, we get an expansive sort of, of, uh, of um, experience, an expansive experience of the impact of her work, mm. uh, both on a very personal and intimate level, as well as very, very powerful statements of historical, at sometimes violent moments um, that our communities have been through. Um, we like to call it the um, anti-biopic biopic because we use <laughs> unconventional forms of telling the story. This is not a typical uh, uh, profile piece. It is a piece that is intentionally told exclusively and uniquely through Nikki Giovanni's voice. There are no interviews or outside experts talking to us about her. This is her in her own voice, of course, with our vision as directors in terms of what for us resonated as important and uh, uh, where we wanted to put the envelope from a narrative perspective, but through the engagement of her words and her performances. So what, what uh, Nikki Giovanni um, uh, wants is to go to Mars. And yeah. uh, she has wanted that, she has had that goal since she was 12 years old. And uh, one of the things that she says is that black women, um, based on their experience now and, and in history with the transatlantic slave trade, are uniquely positioned for that journey. And uh, she spends uh, an hour, an hour and a half in this film convincing us that Mars is the place. Uh, and we have to come to terms of, with with her argument, but more importantly, our audience is encouraged to think of what Mars really means for them. And I found myself in tears during the first rough cut uh, because uh, that realization was powerful. It takes me back to my mom, right? But for Nikki, it's grandma. And so, so she's able to take this uh, complex uh, thought and translate it uh, into relationships. And that's how we make this uh, quasi-experimental biopic into something that's really relatable to, to everyone. 
what is your goal in life? How do you achieve that? Uh, and you see that through the many phases of um, uh, uh, Nikki's life and how uh, that turns out for her over 80 years. I, I, I'm reluctant to, to tell you more because there, there would be uh, too many spoiler, spoiler alerts. Yeah. But what I, what I, what I can say <laughs> is that uh, people come, people have come to, come to the theater saying, I, I thought this was a movie on space, <laughs> uh, but I realized it was a movie about me. We watch mm. audiences lean in. Uh, but more importantly, this is a, a, a poet speaking. Uh, and poets usually take truth and give it to you in ways that you've never seen it. Mm. Um, uh, I think uh, one scene that does that for me is when she discusses Nick, uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Oh, and she gives us a perspective idea. and she gives us perspective on the relationship between uh between uh Mr. Claus and Rudolph this illuminating dropped something <laughs> yeah no honestly i thought it was a very earnest honest self discovery documentary and i felt like as the audience we were going on a journey um, with her and usually I think sometimes documentaries try to portray a certain image or portray themselves in a certain way but it just felt so relatable because she was just 100% herself and I felt inspired even more so I was like right I've got to speak my mind more <laughs> I've got to do this <laughs> got to carve out time for myself um, and just things like you know her her putting herself first and putting her health first and I just feel like again as women as well is probably something that we oh it's fine I can still do it I can march on um and just before I forget where can people watch um going to Mars the Nikki Giovanni project um is available currently on mm -hmm. the platform Max it is an HBO documentary films original uh, uh film and mm -hmm. uh those of you who again have a subscription to Max you can uh, you can reach it. Uh, you can see it there. Uh, we just uh, recently um, um, uh, launched on the platform, so we're very mm. excited to draw people to it. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you will. Um, I think also another thing that I resonated with was how she was able to articulate how you see things as a child versus how you see how they actually are. So when she describes as um, we were poor but I didn't feel feel it or, you know, and stuff like that, I, you just have this, like, things are great, you know, you're just with your siblings, you're having a great time, you're playing out, playing hand games, you know, whatever it might be, um, and all the adult stuff, uh, you don't really know or think about or see, um, but I just thought she was really, um, was able to articulate that. How long did it take to film the documentary? The film was a seven-year seven years uh, in the making, a labor of love. Wow. That wow. Um, these were, you know, obstacles that we encountered uh, along the way, but, you know, turned them into opportunity for us. You know, mm. the privilege of being able to spend seven years with uh, Nikki Giovanni and uh, yeah. document some, uh, you know, parts of her life over those years really um, provided a number of uh, beautiful gems for us. Um, the, uh, the, to include in the film, but also it allowed us to really explore uh, layers of uh, creativity um, that I think if we had were on a sh if we were on a short uh, time frame, we might not have reached uh, yeah. uh, as easily, yeah. if at all, because there's a lot of layering in the film uh, where we uh, intentionally um, avoid uh, literal exposition. And it's about the archival being in conversation with um, the narration, with the poetry, and uh, um, with the sound and the music. It takes you on a journey. It definitely takes you on a journey, which um, 
I appreciate. In the doc, um, Nikki's asked about the role of her friends or friends. What has the role of friends played in your life? Joe, Michelle? Uh, I think uh, f friends, we're, we're a communal society. And, uh, you know, Nikki tries to say that she is not friendly, but she's yeah. very social. And uh, she loves a crowd. She lives in a community where everyone knows her name. Uh, and I think uh, friends are a superpower. And, uh, and uh, without friends and family, it is hard to survive. And uh, so, and it's more than survive. It's to, uh, to to thrive and to have joy. And so that's what friends mean to me. That's why I live in the community I, I live in. Uh, and I think we all do the same. Michelle, do you want to add anything for you? <laughs> no, I mean, you know, that, 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 that's what fuels us, right? This mm -hmm. idea that the healing in this storytelling process is not just um, individual, it is collective as well. Whether it's the people who we work with and how we engage with the material, whether it's you know the friendships that we develop with Nikki and her spouse, Ginny, along the way. We know that those things are in some way life, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we try to <sighs> emphasize that in the film. I think that's part of our vision and our priority that may or may not be uh, Nikki's, but that she definitely exudes, whether mm. I'll reveal sort of a little bit, this the Afropunk scene mm. uh, for those who know that festival and her yeah. her performance there, you know, show um, um, a community coming together that is intergenerational, but is also sharing mm. a lived experience that is healing and self-reinforcing, you know, mm. and accepting. So. Mm. Uh, that's what centers us in our process as part of why we do what we do. Amazing. I've always wanted to go to Afropunk. It looks like an amazing festival. Nikki Giovanni is extraordinarily inspiring, but what inspired you to tell the story? So, well, we were coming out of a 13-year um, exclusively observational film that we had done that actually turned the camera on ourselves and our son. Uh, Joe and I are life partners and creative partners. And uh, it, the film is called American Promise. Uh, it premiered also at Sundance and uh, won a jury prize there. Um, but we wanted to flex our creative muscles after doing a film that was largely, you know, uh, longitudinal but observational in nature. And um, we're toying with the idea of doing a profile film. And we heard Nikki on the radio um, in an interview while we were figuring out what our next step was going to be. And um, we were, again, sort of, triggered by the memories of her, the impact of her poetry on us um, and uh, decided we wanted to sort of take the leap and uh, reach out to her and see if she would be willing for us to uh, work with her on a film about her work. So one of the things that we like to do, uh, you know, I, I'm a physician and Michelle's an attorney and we yeah. change professions because we yeah. love art and we thought art is um, political, and we're political too. Uh, but as artists, we like to play uh, with multiple colors and, uh, and, and multiple tools. So we've done VR, we've done uh, AR, we've done augmented reality, we've done uh, short form animation, and so we wanted to work and, and, uh, and do something that was creatively different. So we decided this was going to be uh, a combination of tell and telling her stories and a combination of I'm not your Negro meets uh, Kurt Cobain. And so we spent a fair amount of time trying to figure out how to do that using multiple planes of storytelling. Uh, and so we use the archival plane. 
We use an interview, another variation of archival, the interview with between James Baldwin and Nikki that occurred in London in 1971. I love that interview. Yeah. Uh, we also use her performance. You know, she's she's mm. quite the performer. Um, a comedic uh, stand-up uh, performer. And then we use her poetry. And we have each one of those levels talk to each other. Uh uh, as opposed to having um, one level uh, and having the other, the archival, for example, just repeat what's just been said mm. so that uh, it's more compelling, it's more complex. And sometimes, uh, and I mean by complex, some one level, instead of just repeating what she says, may say the opposite, may pose an opposite question. And so it's, it's, uh, it's, it was fun for us. And I think we've discovered a way of, of telling these stories, the, the documentary form, uh, I said discover, I mean, we've rediscovered uh, that is less commercial and more entertaining. Well, I just want to say thank you, both of you, so much for sharing your time with us, discussing these two amazing documentaries, Going to Mars, The Nikki Giovanni Project, and Black Girls Play, The Story of Hand Games. Um, I'm sure everyone will go and enjoy them as well. But I just want to wish you guys the best of luck. Um, and thank you so much for coming on Black Ink Cinema Podcast. Thank you, Rachel, for, for having us. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.